uh, everybody, it's 7 o'clock, so we're going to start. We have a uh, limited agenda tonight. We're talking about signage and marijuana, but not necessarily in that order. Um, but before we start, we've got public comment. So if anybody in the public has anything to offer up that has, doesn't have anything to do with what we're about to talk about, uh, this is your time. So does anybody in the audience tonight have anything they want to share? No? All right. So... First up, who's uh, walking us through this? Uh, sign we're starting with signage, play signs. So this is just, you know, there's always an interest in merchants downtown to have more signage for the buildings. Um, although we actually have not heard any complaints or concerns from merchants for a number of years. It seems like we've down the right balance between not too many signs and certain merchants. But there's a growing trend in a lot of cities about the so-called blade signs. Um, and cities usually like them, I and mean, obviously merchants like them because it makes their business attractive. But they're more focused, because they're narrow signs, they're small, they're really focused on the pedestrians and not on the cars, which I think is really want to do. Um, so we began discussions just a couple months ago about is there a way to play signs? We can look at other communities, most notably Brookline, because they spent frankly, a lot of time doing research on doing this. So the draft word, did you pass that word in session? We emailed it, yeah. Okay, yeah. So the ordinance you got is heavily borrowed from Brookline. Certainly, the square footage is borrowed from Brookline. So the idea of not doing not these are non-lit signs the way we're defining them here, uh, and small signs. But the idea is that these would be extra signs. So you could do a, a lay sign over and above whatever else. Is. We're still playing with whether it should be three feet or four feet. Did you talk to us? No, we never got back okay. to that. So we're thinking the width, the width of the blade should match the, the width of um, warning signs. And frankly, I'm not exactly sure what warning signs are. So whether it's, you know, how far they stick out from the building. Match, match the width of what? Width of an awning, so like an awning itself. How far out from the building. How far it projects. So if you have a right. triangular awning, so that distance it would go under an awning, essentially, maybe have it the same. And we, I, we wouldn't do more than four feet. We're assuming the awning is not. We don't want to do more than four feet if we use four feet. Yeah, that seems deep. And deep the depth of an awning seems than one for a sign, especially sticking out on a, on a sidewalk. Right. Yeah, that's that's so still, high. That's still crazy. I mean, <clears throat> so a blade sign, you could, you could have a, a, it just means perpendicular, basically, right? Yeah. Perpendicular, but typically it's 290 degrees. So typically the long axis is what's so it's not perpendicular. If, if this is the face of the building, and you're yeah, walking yeah. down the sidewalk, it's perpendicular. It's perpendicular to the building. To the building yeah. right? But it's, it sort of sticks out more like that. Okay. Okay. The long dimension is out. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And so the, the only, I mean, we allow these type of signs now. They're, um, they're considered either or. So if you have a wall sign that faces the street, then a, um, a hanging sign or this blade sign would be considered second signage that would automatically trigger a special permit for the Zoning Board of Appeals. And also, we only allow one foot projection from the wall, so that perpendicular distance, which is makes for a small sign. And some people are fine with it. Some people have gone for special permits, but it sort of eliminates. It's because the wall sign has potentially different, um, you know, target um, viewing than a blade sign. Then we felt like instead of putting a barrier there, an additional barrier for businesses that to allow both. We didn't, the dimension, we were just trying to figure out what that work right. we, we began this, as, as I say, sort of stealing from what Brookline did in terms of their dimension, which we did a lot. But, um, so we have suggested four feet. Louis looked at this. Louis had the buildings back there. And he was very comfortable with this. He thought maybe three feet made sense. It's somewhere in that range of three feet and four feet. I still like the four feet because it makes them longer and thinner. What is there? Is there a um... total square footage? Okay. Is there a total square there is a total footage? So this this could it could be a bracket with a round sign. It could be a, a, a tall skinny sign. It could yep. be a projecting. You know, That's correct. Rectangle. It just seems like if you take the width of this desk, and you stick it out on the sidewalk level. Uh, that just that just seems deeper than it needs to be. Well, I mean, and then hey, Louis just was going from four feet to three feet. Right? Mm -hmm. I don't know. I'm comfortable four feet, but I'm on the three feet too. Yeah. And is it nine feet high? Is that, is that what you want to do? Seven foot. Seven? Yeah. Is this, is this, is this, is this, and 90. Nine. Is this 
something that there is a crying public need for, or just somebody sitting around thinking of things to do? You know, it's interesting. I, I've been doing a bunch of these panels helping downtowns, other cities, and almost no matter who's on the panel, people who are interested in downtown recommend towns a lot of way of signs. It's a sort of a way to make it more vibrant. Because the signs that are really focused on pedestrians, most of our signs are more visible from the road. And if what we really want to do is make it a pedestrian. Or across the street. Yeah. Or across the street, right. Mm -hmm. Right, so the red, this is on the, the third page, the red is the red. I'd be really bored if they take down the other sign and put up a blade sign instead. But we're just going to get more signs. Yes. Right. That, to me, it seems like this is a secondary sign. So the primary sign is there for traffic. This is for pedestrians. So it, it's supplementary. But they have a four-foot wide sign almost to me, it's just the, it's substantial enough to, that would be your primary sign, but that's not what we're looking for. We're looking for a... Because the limit on your tens Right. But I'm just saying, even if, even if it's just, if it's a foot tall by four feet wide sticking out of the building, it just it just seems awkward. Mark, are you more confident? I mean, it's three feet? Three feet's better than four. Um, All right, well, let me try this. What about if, and what, what I would really like is to have blade signs replacing the other signs over time. That's not going to happen for existing businesses. But as new businesses come in, if they, we will get blade signs put up when we allow them. And as new businesses come in, we can get blade signs on those businesses in lieu of the wall front signs. And we would actually, in the long run, transition to a town that has pedestrian signage instead of car signage. But okay. is there a problem with the wall signage? I mean, we, we've had a transition itself. The wall signage has, for a while, it was growing, and now it's the merchants themselves are growing. You know, I'm not sure we have a problem with the wall signage. Okay. We do on King Street, but on Main Street, I'm not sure. Well, yeah. the other piece of it is, if you're walking on one side of Main Street and you're looking for a shop on the other side, the wall sign helps you as a pedestrian and vice versa. So, okay. then you wouldn't be able to see the blade sign otherwise. Okay. I don't have a problem with the wall sign if the supplementary signage isn't accessible. So, so thank you. Blade signage to me was small enough that it, it, or large enough that it had its intended effect so that if you're walking down the sidewalk, you see three storefronts ahead, that's the store I'm looking for. That's fine, but I don't think you need to hit somebody in the head. So if it was three feet out, should there also be a smaller square footage? Because we did 10 feet, sort of based on four feet out, and so how, how high up do you want to go on over there? Yeah. I, I, I think so. Yeah. Uh, there's Already exists if we feel like this would be a good thing. I mean, I, I can't picture. I mean, there's signs now, on, especially on upper floors on Main Street, you know, frame shops or something, where there's a blade sign sticking out of the second floor. But it's yeah, but usually. It out a foot. Right, it's usually a long yeah. rectangle of a foot it's or something. Like a banner. It's almost like a yeah. banner. Like yeah. off the wall or something. Right. I, I, if they can already do that, then why do they need more? Because the foot doesn't really give you a lot of visibility. Almost has to be this way, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Limiting as far as well. Of course, it's yeah. I, mean, I would question if, if we have any existing blade signs that are that big today. Um, we don't have that stick out before. No. We've gotten a few special permits for more than a foot, but the, I don't recall that they've gone up to, I mean, I'm thinking, I think Woodstar has one that's more than a foot pedestrian, but it's not four feet, it's just a little bit more than a foot. So. Right. Does Brookline have a lot of them at this four foot? So they just passed this last so That's not so. the answer. <laughs> yeah. right, right. Okay. I'm sure we could find some examples. Well, I'm just thinking about the rectangle dimensions, and if you want to go to three feet, I don't think we need a 10 foot square foot limit. I mean, you know, even a six square foot limit means you're going to have a two foot sign if the blade is two feet up. You know, it, it's no longer a blade, it's a 
rectangle that's fairly so um, I mean I'm leaning towards a sign that is linear if you want to come out. Well, I can see if, if you came out you, you could have a bracket. I think I can't is which star is that a bracket with a sign yeah. hanging underneath yeah. it? Something like that. Um, which would be decorative and, and stick out. Sign also. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just because it's perpendicular. Okay. But but it doesn't have to be you know, sticking out in 20 square feet, I think you'd still have 10 square feet and be, you know. Uh, Deborah, are you arguing in favor or against? No, I, I think I'm uh, leading, uh, leading the, you all to correct me in, in the discussions. <laughs> I'm just feeling my way through it, actually. I, I think I have other shapes besides rectangle legs would be circles or right. shield shaped or... Right. Um, I, I think this airs on the side of... Right. Uh, Excess, and I'd rather err on the side of, of I small, think, or smaller. I think we need to do more homework on this. I think we need to get some conceptual realization of what the signs would look like, what the worst case would be. Um, well, and I guess I wonder if, if we're are we solving something? Have you had a lot of requests for them? Or we have had a lot of requests. I think it's really more about you know, how we make it more interesting for pedestrians and more informative. Right. Well, but we've also not had a lot of requests because it's a financial obligation and a permit review. So people might hear the one, you know, can't be more than one foot, and then yes. stop there. Uh, if we were interested in putting up parking signage, is that in any way related to this topic? So doing street signage is exempt from zoning. So DPW is doing things, those ugly metal things, that those don't need to do. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we do it. <laughs> I guess I'm just wondering about kind of the order of magnitude. I mean, if you were in a very large city looking down a very long street, I could see where this might be helpful. But if you're in downtown Northampton, you can stand on one corner and see both ends of downtown. I, I don't know. I'm just, I don't Do we really need more signage that no one seems to be, we seem to be solving a problem that doesn't exist. You know what always struck me? This is nothing to do with signage, but I have to say it was one of the things that really struck me. 20 years ago we did this. We, when we did our downtown plan in 1994, so we gave um, a bunch of interns counters to measure how people walk down the street. And I'm always struck by the people who, there's a lot more traffic across the street from Blasky Park than Blasky Park. Smith students coming down, we deliberately cross, because storefronts were more aligned. I, I sort of feel the same way at Blade Songs. They just, they added, we, we don't want visual clutter, but we also want visual activity. I think they add, a, I think if well done, they add life to the street to make it more interesting. I think people walk to the edge and then look up trying to see what uh, what the story is as well. Um, I, I like them myself. Well, I'm usually so busy trying to avoid stepping on dog poop. I don't look up at the sun. You live in Paris? <laughs> <laughs> But in, going back to Devin's point, you know, if you're asking me this where the places where I think there's too much signage, no, it's the, no, no, uh, no. the sandwich board signs. Right. You know, there's a separate thing we've talked about years ago about using street lights, street posts for sandwich board signs to demand that they have to be a separate thing that's not a zoning thing. I, I, I mean, not, so there's a thought. So if you could be a storefront, you have your, your main sign. A blade sign and a sandwich board. No, we don't allow sandwich board signs on Main Street first floor. We allow them on basement things and side streets. And side streets. Okay. We did. We right, 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 right. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm not opposed to the the concept of, of you know, more blade signs or regulated blade signs. I just think this right now is is it just feels too big. Um, I, I don't know what the, the magic number is. Well, we could either do. You know, three foot signs and six square feet, or spend more time looking at examples. We want to talk about best of work. I mean, I don't think I don't think it would, it would it would take long. I don't think the discussion would be a long one if we found a couple of examples and said, you know, this is six square feet. This is a, this is a bracket with a round sign. This is a rectangle, and then we could make a quick decision that okay, six feet is good, ten feet is too much, or whatever it might be. Um, and since there isn't a driving need, I, I don't, I don't feel the need to make a decision tonight. I think we'll just get a little more information and make a decision. You good with that? Yeah. Okay. Who's going to leave the
talk on marijuana. Now, there's a blade sign. You could have a good one with that. I guess I'll start this. <laughs> so, um, you know, we've had discussions for a while sort of thinking about medical marijuana, what are the appropriate places for doing it. Um, I think at least at the staff level, so obviously not speaking for you all, we're not particularly concerned about where medical marijuana comes in as long as it's in the same places where the equivalent use would be allowed. So you could imagine, in essence, there's three components that you could imagine medical marijuana taking it looking like. One mm -hmm. is the growing facility, the growing processing facility. And this is primarily going to be a warehouse use. The security issues are so strict in Massachusetts that it's, it's certainly not going to be a free from crop mm -hmm. in someone's backyard. Mm -hmm. It could, in theory, be a greenhouse. But the security requirements of the greenhouse are so strict, that's unlikely, especially because they're going to license these things on, on or about January 1st, and they have to have a the ground in 120 days. So if you were going to do a greenhouse, you'd have to buy it, you know, build a new greenhouse with really th thick plexiglass. So, you know, so we're mostly talking about the processing is going to be in a warehouse type thing. Um, the Massachusetts will require these things to be vertically integrated. So who's ever building these, whoever has this, has to grow their own marijuana, process it, dry whatever they do. If they're going to want brownies, they're going to want some sort of food product that goes in, they have to do that themselves. And they have to sell it. So, so one place has to own all those things. They could be in the same site, or they could be different sites. The benefit of being the same site is you could have a license in both Hampshire County and Hamden County and have just one growing facility. The disadvantage is that expensive product and means you're shipping to some so there's some appeal from a security standpoint. So um, and obviously a dispensary could be like a pharmacy, imagine that, where you go and you get you know, your doctor your right prescription. Or it could also be this is not required in Massachusetts, it could be vertically integrated where you go see X company's doctor who prescribes it to you and passes it to you. Um, everything has to be bagged, so there's you know there's a lot of details. Um, and my style, at least, is the growing and processing is really fine any place, as long as we deal with details of it. Um, and I'll come back to the details in a second. The selling is really fine any place we allow pharmacies and any place we allow doctors. And so I'm, I'm not suggesting any controls of those things we have already, which is why, we haven't, why you haven't seen this earlier. Because if we did absolutely nothing, the zoning would allow medical marijuana uses the same things that a similar use is going on. Um, PVPC put together a meeting sort of to, to bring in some experts, a couple of lawyers who are at nationwide practice doing this in other states, someone who runs a, a chain of dispensaries in Colorado. And I didn't hear anything that made me concerned about the, um, the location issue, but I think I was struck by the volume we're talking about. So the state's going to have a minimum 19 units, one per county, and a maximum 35. The figure they were using is one to three percent of the population will be buying medical marijuana. We're six million people in the state, so that's a lot of people. If there's only 19, if there's only one or maybe even two in Hampshire County, we're talking a lot of volume. So the same thing that makes me concerned about a fast food restaurant applies. No more, but no less. For that. And then security issues, I think the law covers, I'm not worried about security issues, but I am worried about um, the dome security is big cameras moving back and forth and big fences and those sorts of things. And you could do great security, you know, banks are a good example. You could do great security and not be ugly. And pawn shops are example. the other thing you can do. <laughs> great security and be really ugly. And I want it to look like a bank and not a pawn shop. Um, the third one, this is relatively small, but because they've been growing this stuff um, indoors, they're really high electric uses. And we've been trying to Green Northampton, so one of the thoughts is they have the right to use you know, fossil fuel like everybody else does, but the extra bit of electricity that they're using because of the nature of these things, then maybe we should ask them to mitigate those. So, so what the draft is before you is thinking about, again, not touching the location, which is only allows, but dealing with all those details. Time is critical. Where is the late science is no hurry. Time is critical for this one because otherwise we, people can start getting ready. We know there's a lot of interest. A few people have been coming to visit us. So there's these five who got listed in Hampshire County. And many of them, I don't know the answer, are looking at Northampton. And there's one who was listed as, as Hampton County, and they're actually looking up here as well. 
you know, who knows who's really going to show up. They're now at the next stage of funding the site. So. That's correct. So the question of its proximity to schools, for instance, is probably not the same issue as it would be. And the state actually does have some setbacks for that stuff. But yes, that's not my concern mm -hmm. um, because, because of those things. Mm -hmm. it is, it just, just clear, we hold city offices. Planning and building were comfortable locations. Board of Health did express that concern. They were concerned, particularly about Main Street, that a place on Main Street might feel like a head shop. And I don't think that's true given where the where the Department of Health regulations are. But do you want a closed store on Main Street that has no front that has liveliness to it? Well, we require some kind of glazing. So you couldn't see the product, but you could do other, you're just doing the lawyer's offices down there. You could do the storefront window. Um, but there are issues in terms of security. You can't get in unless you have a card mm -hmm. from the state. Yeah. The price of land downtown is going to make that but you could have the warehouse out in Industrial Park, and you could have the dispensary on there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, the price of the land would make Main Street first floor prohibitive. It wouldn't necessarily make it on Center Court or some building on the second floor, you know, where, where the rent's gone. Yeah. I'm getting a little confused by you talking about growing and processing, but medical marijuana is, requires a prescription, right? I can't see it being any more popular than other drugs that you need prescriptions for. People are, don't run in every day to fill a prescription. When you was making a rise in Colorado, how many people got prescriptions? But there's not as many pharmacies. I mean, there's right. a lot more pharmacies right. than there okay. would be. Dispensary. Why didn't they just have pharmacies sell it as a prescription drug, right? Prescription drug, right? I think we have the regulations that we have. I don't disagree with you. But because there's only going to be one or most two of these in Hampshire County, that's very different than, you know, all the CVSs and right. Walgreens that we have. And, and they can they can grow and dispense in two places, but they have to be run by the same overarching. That's correct. And it's not, I don't understand the regulations in detail. You can even have a management company. I think for our purposes, it's one company, it's one nonprofit who owns it. The person who's actually growing it could be a management company. Can I read this? Maybe I wasn't fed, but it was really. Medical marijuana is a subset of medical uses and medical dispensaries and is allowed in any facilities where new physicians' offices and new dispensaries and pharmacies may be located, but not locations where medical uses and dispensaries are allowed only as a pre existing non conforming use, and for any growing or processing without dispensaries in any industrial area. But doesn't that mean that pharmacies can sell it? No. Well, from our regulations, this would. But, but remember who wrote this? <coughs> so this is what I'm suggesting for us. Okay. But we don't get to I mean, the, the health department, state health department, has written statewide regulations. We didn't repeat them because that, that's the minimum floor. So the state is licensed and is very close. There's lots of details that we're not going into because the state's doing it. But one, one thing is they have all these regulations. You can't get in the building unless you have a card that says you're eligible. So CDS couldn't sell. Okay. And they also have to be run by nonprofits. So what you're wanting planning? Is that a lot of what you're wanting planning board to consider is the effect on energy use and traffic. Yeah. So let me walk you through this. I can't. I just want to give you the background. So the first part, what Franny was reading from, is just the definition of what we're talking about for medical marijuana. Um, I am just in the second part. We're not talking about special permit. These would be allowed by right. Mm -hmm. um, but it should be site plan approval. So you get to look at those details. We're doing it, so that's what 11.2 just says, is we're looking at these automatic intermediate projects. Um, the third section, this partially applies to this, but also doesn't apply to everything else. We've always said for traffic mitigation, so, so nothing goes medical marijuana for a second. For traffic mitigation, you either do bricks and mortar work to address traffic issues based on your portion of flow, or you pay a payment in lieu of, and we had a formula for the payment in lieu of. There was a Supreme Court case that basically says we have to do individual fact-based analysis. So we're changing this. The table that said we had to pay is now the maximum. We still have the right to have a maximum, and you will have to do a fact-based analysis. Our numbers are conservative enough from the city's standpoint that I suspect in the vast majority of cases someone will have to pay that. 
but we're after the assessment for each one. And you've done this already, so the Bear Hill, which is elderly housing, um, you didn't require the maximum because they <laughs> don't can, think so. I'm sorry. Interstricted house. Interstricted house. Which I read. So they paid a small fee because they could convince they convinced you all, your predecessors, that a fewer percentage, smaller percentage of people living there were commuting during rush hour. So you, you've always done that sort of assessment. So that that theft in, in blue appears as color on the top of this uh, rating two is would apply to everything. This is partially to address the, the court case. And we I sent this to our attorney. He may or may not have some changes for that, but we need to do that regardless. The the next thing is setting a, a a fee, the traffic mitigation. So currently we go from zero in downtown, $1,000 in the edge of downtown, 2000 on King Street, 3000 in suburban areas. I basically suggested the King Street type model, 2000 is the peak. Then we use, we have a table that says how much trips we expect people to generate. And we need a little bit of work on this because we don't have a lot, but the way these seem to be measured, at least at this workshop I went to is, how many people can you process per hour? Um, and they were talking about basically it takes five minutes after you, when you come back the second time, you're not learning, it takes five minutes per, uh, per session. So figure for each cash register, you're going to be accommodating you know, some number. So we can play with the exact number if we do a little more research on that. But they're high. But again, we're only charging for the one peak hour. So this isn't the entire day's use. This is between 4 and 6 p.m., whatever we'd expect the most number of trips to be done that day. Because that's where we're building our sidewalk. And then the next one, this is the, the main discussion, is what are the what are the specific criteria for approval and the site plan approval. And so what I have here is once to begin the discussion, the hours that can be open, um, the the fully dis I'm trying not to be too much from the state, so I'm not really sure we need even need be because it's required in state law, but it's you know it's in one place. I think that speaks to what Anne was suggesting that, uh, you know, you and I had talked about that, I've thought about in the context, but I think that could cover, you could end up creating blank walls that way, and it could be from the interior, so there could be a complete, like, like amazing.net, for example, they put a false, you know, wall, I mean, that was a requirement in yeah. the ordinance, but there's nothing there that says that they would have to do the same thing. Well, that's the next one, though. So that's what C is about. So C is, we get security questions, but as secure from the outside of the building, it's consistent with the character of the neighborhood. So for an area with storefronts, if you have storefronts, you're not trying to restrict security, but it has to be camouflaged to fit in the background. So that's really what that one is. Right, but I think the, I, I would, I could see that someone would interpret that, that only as it relates to security do we mm. have to make it look right. like the rest of okay. the downtown. So we can say visual. Too. And the one, I think for B to address what Ann was suggesting, I think would be important because all aspects of the use, I mean, you still kind of want to have that inviting presence if yep. you're on Main Street or even in the Antiquated Business District yep. where we're trying to create that pedestrian presence. Okay, that's fair. Mm -hmm. All right, so then C is sort of related. I, I think you're right about the rewriting <coughs> of C. C is partially about, again, it's the bank security and not the, the pawn shop security. Um, D is just sort of you know, these typically people using activated carbon, some sort of thing to catch the, the smell. And we're talking about not only obviously the smell of marijuana, but also, I assume like everything else in the world, you can buy organic marijuana and non-organic marijuana if you want to catch herbicides and pesticides and you know, whatever else there is in the air. Um, <laughs> and then the, uh, the electricity use. Um, I did 50% sort of arbitrary. I asked Chris Mason, to, who is our energy officer, to do a little research and wait a year back, but trying to understand its electric use for some different. What I wanted was something that's easily measurable. Solarized There you go. I, I get E, or the intent of E, yeah. but isn't that singling out? I mean, what if you're a, a high end nursery or a greenhouse that requires a lot of electricity? We're not, we're not requiring them to provide right, electricity. Right. Right. Yeah, I guess you're absolutely right. I think some of this is these are among the highest electricity uses per square foot, other than manufacturing, obviously, which is not here. Um, and frankly, because the state is limiting the number of these things, the volume of business that they're doing is so much that you're not going to get any pushback. I guess that's part of the reality. 
for if you're doing those who have been here forever, Montgomery Roads, you know that was marginal business, and if you made them mitigate half their, their use, they would have failed a lot sooner. Right. That's not that's this is not they're not triple economic. So mm -hmm. some of it is, is for that reason. Okay. I don't disagree with you. You know, okay. so that's it. In terms of Does anybody from the public want to speak on this issue? Okay. Um, one thing, Wayne, that we didn't talk about was um, in a situation where there might be new construction, what kind of parking ratio would be necessary? Um, even if it's, you know, for yeah. expansion for central business or business. So if there's that much volume, I mean, I don't know that, I guess central business doesn't matter because we don't require parking. Yep. Yeah, we can go, I, I don't know the answer. We can come up with numbers yeah. consistent with volume. Um, and, and, and we can in the districts if we don't require parking anyway. Entrance and GI, I wouldn't want to require parking for this. In the districts we do require parking, uh, we can figure out what that is. I'm not sure about right? Yeah, I mean, it may be that because of it, it has to be sort of a quick turn to keep that there will be existing facilities, but I just mean maybe expansion. Right, right. Existing I, I will say that. While these are very high traffic businesses for where traffic mitigation, you don't stay there for a long right. time. So the parking I don't expect to be the same as something we've stayed. Right. You could you could have have drive through. Along with your six pack, right? Yeah. 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 I think we're treating this as if it's going to be a retail pot selling operation rather than a prescription drug selling operation. And I just think there's an enormous difference in magnitude what we're going to expect is from the retail standpoint. So, I don't so I know, think unless they can only sell only unless you can only buy a supply for one day at a time. No, you can buy a lot. I mean, with the, with people said in Colorado, they, they pointed out that Colorado's a little different, that I think the figure is 300 dispensaries in Denver alone, but that the average person is buying a two-month supply. Um, so, you know, again, that may be different here. Um, I think these rules are more, I think it's going to be harder with the, with the charges that people have to have and the registration that they have to have in order to do it, I think. One of the things, and I know this legislation that may change, is one of the concerns for a lot of people is at this point we can't use a credit card um, because you know federal audit concerns the drug, and so the credit card companies could lose their assets. And so one of the reasons security issues is a big deal is you know a lot of cash is going through that. That, and that may change, and, and a lot of people involved in this are very optimistic, but it has to change. Originally, there was a discussion about the banking system not supporting this in, in a framework. How, how has that been solved? Well, that's that's why that's an issue. Yeah, you can't you can't get traditional bank financing as I've been told, and you can't mm -hmm. use a credit card. Um, Can you help me understand um, the like, where the, where where that came from? You know, it's how it isn't arbitrary, like when you're saying like the uh, Montgomery Rose operation, yeah. you wouldn't assess it because they couldn't afford it. Uh, just help me understand how this is a sort of an equality. So in an ideal world, what we would have done, this is what an early draft did for this, said is figure out what the, if, you're, if, you're, if your dispensary looks and feels like CVS, figure out how much electricity CVS uses per square foot, figure out how much use of these use per square foot, and they should be mitigating the difference. That becomes really hard to do, and so that's why we just think we present it as sort of an arbitrary use. Um, it's a new use, so we're treating it differently, and so that's part of the reason we're we're trying to mitigate. You know, the city is now doing a lot of things across the board, trying to encourage, I mean, including things that you guys have done for, for PD. This is coming out of sustainable Northampton. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, Correct me if I'm wrong, but most greenhouses depend on the sun, and Pot operations traditionally have been in attics and in basements <laughs> where there is no sun. So I don't see necessarily pot growing operations that are legal and, or maybe, I don't know, maybe you can't you see, see the, the light of day. So. Yeah, 
I don't understand why the electricity would be so intense. Because because it's a security care. issue. Because it's really easy to break into it. Not just seeing you do it. It's really easy to break into a greenhouse. Yeah. You got a thin barrier for easy to get to it. Except for that Lexan. Yeah, uh, but that, that's the issue. You can't do it. Yeah. yeah. Because it's pretty easy to break into, so most of these are going to be in warehouses for a while. Do you not watch Weeds? <laughs> what? Have you not watched the show Weeds? I, I suppose. Weeds. 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 TV show. program. I recommend. Just the first couple of I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so are you looking for a nod from us? To yeah, this one I'd like to do. Right. You'll see it again. Well, I'd actually like to vote to introduce it. You'll see it again, obviously, when you come back to the public hearings and discussion. Mm -hmm. Just because it's online. Mm -hmm. uh, we talked about a couple, you know, you know, amending B and C. Yep. And then the parking ratio. Mm -hmm. Right. I think that's the main thing. The visual appearance in the parking lot. Oh, and actually, we need to do a little more work on traffic generation. That was sort of a very quick back down below. So mm -hmm. those are the three things that I think are my most important. If by any chance you get any more specific information on the electricity use, then you can send that to me. Yeah, thank you. Any issues? I have an issue. I just want to go back and summarize where we started with Randy reading the definition. Basically, this business use can can happen anywhere that would have accommodated a medical use, and that so in that sense, it's we're not making any grand change to zoning. That's right. Considered a business use. And that's why I'm telling one of the considered evil in the zoning world is to use definitions to create the rules. That's why we're just saying, here's what it is. It's allowed exactly the table use regulations allow. Right. What, uh, what's the next highest percentage on the mitigation for, for back to ease? There, I just want to for a point of reference. Can you talk a little louder, please? As the whole board. What the next <laughs> highest percentage is uh, as far as required mitigation? This is electricity? Yeah. Yeah, it could be anything. I'll try to get a better sense for Chris. But, but do we have any? Currently, we don't. No. No. We do a lot of things for traffic mitigation, but for electricity mitigation, we don't do anything right now. So this would be the first. Uh, it, it's, it's, it just see, it just um, often tastes funny. You're not to to charge fifty percent just because we can, because it won't be pushed back. There's it, also that's a, the wrong. Yeah. Sort of precedent. It's also because I mean, they were really high electricity uses. And so yeah, I get that, but then but then you're looking for a number that has more fact than that. It's it. grounded more it's grounded, you know, and this, it seems somewhat arbitrary. And again, if there's gonna be so few dispensaries that they're gonna just say yes to whatever we whatever criteria we lay out, um, that still shouldn't, I don't think take advantage of that situation. It should be it should be applicable across the board or close to it. Um, so that if there are other operations like among Thunder Rose or something, mm -hmm. it's I would think it's more in keeping with with this precedent. Yeah. Well I mean frankly I'd love us to do that sometimes. Yeah. Who's, who's using more out of their class? You know, I don't want to stop someone who's who's making uh, you know uh, cement because the cement uses enormous amount of electricity. But I wouldn't mind stopping someone who's, who's wasting using cement. Right. Yeah, no, that makes but sense. But I'm in the same framework, even kind of bristling about it being a, part, a, a traffic mitigation. In that case, we're asking them to um, help us as the city provide services. We're providing, you know, responsible for roads and traffic. So that's our service. I don't feel like we're a utility provider. And so, but, oh, I see what you're saying. So that's why this one feels, I'm, I'm kind right. of feeling awkward about it too. But we have, for example, in sustainable entertainment, one of our goals, that, and remember it's one of our things we look at with issuing permits, is to reduce our carbon footprint by 50% by 2040, I think. Um, I'm not opposed to the idea that, that businesses <coughs> by their class should not waste yeah. money and not get penalized for it, even if they can afford to, because in the long run it is an infrastructure yeah. production issue. But I'm sort of, this, this is the, we're setting precedent here. This is the first step in that. Yeah. And I'd rather it be a 
okay. a, a policy, a whole policy that does that rather than this first one. I, 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 I agree with you. They'll, they'll be raised not in greenhouses because it's, they're going to build facilities to do them and the security will have them you know, use the electricity. I guess that's the reason I, it stood out when I went to that workshop because because there is an option. We could do a greenhouse, but most people aren't going to because it's very interesting. So I'm right. so more and less sympathetic when there's an alternative way to do it. I'm more sympathetic when there is an alternative way to do it. Did you discuss, was this discussed at the workshop? Did other people have a way of dealing with it? Were there other numbers that were We didn't get to that. I mean, PVC does have a working group that's working on this is really more <coughs> just the educational side of what's happened in Colorado, what's happened. I mean, it sort of sounds like what you're saying is they are actually like a cement company and that they use more electricity than most companies. But that, but so then I think that suggests that if you're going to do this for them, you should do it for cement companies as well. But the difference may be that the cement company doesn't necessarily have an option. Mm -hmm. Whereas oh, and they do have an option. They do. Again, it may not be practical in the public health department's things, but one could do this they, as a yeah. right. Or could they use solar? Yeah. Right. And that's certainly why I'm not suggesting anything about heating, because I think there's not an option for heating. Right. Whereas electricity is all about grow lights, which right. you can do. Right. Looks like that needs one more yeah. data. Yeah. So I have a question about, is it just Northampton that is going to be a target area for this thing? No, no, they're looking over the state. You know, and so it's funny, for instance. No, I meant in the Hampshire County. Well, definitely Amherst, definitely East Hampton. <coughs> um, Lots of the hill towns are worried about it. I can't believe they really have a chance of getting it. I mean, it's pretty <laughs> unlikely that someone's going to go to Ashfield. But I think Northampton, East Hampton, and Amherst are certainly credible. The flip side of that is, if we were talking about any other kind of business, we would be begging for it. You I, know? I want it to come here. I'm very much in favor of this. Right. Yeah. I mean, it creates, I mean, you know, from the true business sense, it creates traffic. Traffic is good, and I very much want us to get one dispensary, if not two. But just like we make McDonald's mitigate the traffic, you know, I, said, I want them to mitigate their impact. It's not to say we don't want these uses. I'm right. actually more concerned about the traffic than having the energy. Um, I, I think we do have to provide yeah. traffic yeah. Um, accommodation, whereas utilities will go up and they'll try to fix that when they have to. Yeah, yeah I mean, you know, if you're uncomfortable, you can. You can drop it. This really does come from the sustainable plan saying how do we reduce the carbon footprint. Uh, you've been in conversation with other communities doing planning for this and obviously talked to some people about what kind of local ordinances they have. But is this a new idea? Is this I think so. I, mean, I mentioned a couple people who were sort of intrigued by it but hadn't come up in their past conversation. Well, we've got sustainable Northampton and that may be where we put heavy focus. But well, and I'm, I'm interested more from the policy point of view of expanding the idea to be relevant Right. I mean, I'm not opposed to that, but I think if if we're setting precedent here, then the next business that comes, you know, Montgomery Rose you know, point two, are they going to be, you know, burdened with the same criteria? They're not burdened, but are they, you know, are they going to meet the same criteria? And if not, why not? To that point, I mean, could we not survey the type of business greenhouses and come up with some metric that's a baseline or a common denominator for that? And better than just pulling something out. I don't know if there's enough of those. A actually, then, you could look at it as if it were a greenhouse, except because it has special conditions. So greenhouse level is one thing, except that it has special conditions become a safety, and it can balance out the cost of the safety versus the cost of the electricity. If, if, if there's so much <coughs> that a greenhouse so many square foot of greenhouse would use, and it chooses to go with a covered one for security purposes because it's an unusual business, then, then that's a choice that's made and you have some basis for making the electricity right. charge. Yes. But what if you are a, say, computer data center, where you've got a half acre of, of servers underneath the roof, and you have no alternative as far as the construction of the building, but you're, bless, bless, you, you require a tremendous amount of electricity. But because we have no choice in how you construct the building, then you're not beholden to the, this criteria. That just seems weird. That just seems. Um, but in the same vein as that, I mean, if, if we were looking to bring in a new um, server farm and, and trying to build 
in the infrastructure to support them, I would say we would definitely talk about getting them to use. That's, that's sure, what I'm I saying. I, I think it should be consistent. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think it's the reverse. I mean, you know, having been the applicant before you for Florence Fields, one of the pitches we made to you at the cost of $40,000 for us was that Florence Fields would be net zero electricity. And we said, that's how we're meeting the same North Hampton as part, is that we're, we are going to take it. And, and, and it may not be the same as a set standard, but it would be nice if people started doing that and saying, yeah, I'm going to try to do that. Well, I'm, I'm not hearing that anyone's opposed to this. It just, just make it opposed fair. to mm -hmm. doing this arbitrarily. Mm -hmm. Well, the other reason, frankly, to leave it at this stage is if we keep it in and you're not satisfied during the public hearing process, you're going to just drop it, that you couldn't add it. So let's leave it in and, you know, if you're not comfortable, and we come back to you in a month. Um, at the moment, I'm missing the, the, the metric for how you determine the traffic allowable usage. There's a there's an engineering document that gives you. So the IT, right, yeah. IT, IT yeah. doesn't yeah. exist for. Exactly. Yeah. That was <laughs> point. So how are we going to calculate the traffic for this? So we're trying to figure out. I mean, again, this is based on a very quick assessment of what the guy from Colorado said, which is they process basically 12 people per hour per cash rate. And sort of thinking, okay, so that's 12 people per hour per cash register. Let's count the number of cash registers, some of our employees. Um, Does anybody count the number of cash registers? Well, that would be what someone comes for permit. You know, if you, if you come in and say, I want to have two cash registers, your traffic is going to be higher if you want to do one cash register. So we, you know, we count, for different uses, we count by restaurants, by tables, or by square footage. So it's not unreasonable to count. And we can see. Really busy, they'll add another cash register. Right. And, and we can see what else. I mean, again, the litigation is still the same. What other cash registers? Litigation would be more. Right? Well, what, what? It would go up the more cash registers you have. You mean after the fact? I mean after the fact. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, so I think I mean it's the part we're doing more research on is for California and for Colorado and I guess Washington. Um, you know, there may be little IT studies for those places. It's not been published in IT. But because it's not published, this is new to everybody, yeah. so we're getting our hands around it, but we should have more to go by than that guy in Colorado. Yeah, that's yeah. right. So. Well, that's why I said it's sort of a, a marker for you. I think right. this is sort of similar to the signage ordinance, to the play sign ordinance. Yeah, we need more the traffic's what it says it's going to be. Maybe we do need those four-foot blade signs to oh, okay. direct everybody <laughs> to. I would, not, I would vote against recommending this to the city council. Because of the additional work that's required on what we've yeah, seen there. It's sort of half baked. Use the brownie better. <laughs> <laughs> You've just been waiting to use that since we're still. What's the timeline on this in terms of dates? So they're you know, they're taking applications for the next phase in the next month or so, I've got the exact time period, but in January is what they're talking about announced. So that and people are now lining up there. Some some people already have a bill and lined up for a release, and some are now doing it. Some towns have said no. Some towns have said no, which in some a moratorium backfires, which is the state's more likely to allow you to grow your own marijuana if you don't have a facility in your community. So you may in some ways lose more control in those places. But that's the reason the time becomes so critical. Like I'm hoping you go to the right. Wayne, just in the percent thing. Um, could, and you've been to the hearing, and you know a lot more about it than what I know just in the newspaper, but could someone meet the criteria of the state and really operate as a greenhouse, or would they need to be able to have a commercial operation that is enclosed, that is hydroponic? I mean, My understanding is you could, could, could it really be done? I guess I'm asking, is there really an alternative, or is it really only, I mean, to meet yeah, yeah. all the criteria? My understanding, and someone will claim to be an expert on this, is it's doable, it's probably not doable in the state's 120 win day window because you'd really be talking about a major retrofit. You couldn't take an existing greenhouse. You'd be doing a lot of major retrofit. I'm making it up, use thicker plexiglass, whatever the process is. So you couldn't even with perimeter security? The way it, w it was presented by both the attorneys and, and this place in Colorado is the cost for doing that wouldn't make it work. Technically, it's doable. You wouldn't. You wouldn't want to go that way. 
So you're looking for approval to move this forward. We've identified three or four areas which we have questions on in, in general. Um, don't have the specifics yet, but we want to move it forward so you can get ahead of the January date. Um, so this would move forward and go out to public comment. I mean, the public would be engaged and we have another opportunity to change it at that time if it's still in. Right. And things like the electricity use is easy. If you don't like it, you can just ditch it. Things like the traffic mitigation, we're going to have to have a final number, whatever it is. Um, but so the one I heard you biggest concerned about electricity, and that's the easiest to kill. Maybe the second biggest one, you know, the, the Carolyn's comment about the, the visual piece, I think it's the easiest to address, and park is the easiest to address. And the, the counting, just maybe that's the hardest work for us. But you would revise this based on our comments tonight, and we would bring it back with public comment. I think just to, to say again on, on E, on the 50%, it would be easy to just eliminate it next time, but I, I don't know that, speaking personally, I, I want to eliminate it. I think it, this is an opportunity to have something in there, um, but I don't want to rush it through, and if, if it comes through at 50% and there's pushback, and so we just get rid of it, then it might be an opportunity lost. This might be a situation we can take advantage of as long as we are uh, consistent you know, with, with what yep. may be coming down the line. And have good data. Right. Is there something you've written about, about right. and how, much, how many kilowatts per square foot or some, some way of quantifying it? That's the question I asked Chris Mason to research. So that, yeah, so that other companies that weren't growing marijuana but maybe using a lot of electricity would also be rewarded Using this ICE traffic studies, I don't know much about electricity, but I don't know if there's an equivalent publication. There's some book I open up that says, here's the ex expected electricity use per square foot. I just don't know the answer. I mean, I don't, I don't know if I do Pandora's box. I mean, we have, we talked about a server farm, or a hospital, or a Coca Cola plant, or all these different operations that are open all the time with a lot of electricity. The electric yeah. company sends me a little box that says, right. you know, now they're only doing that for residential and their community category, and I could love to think that we might arrive at a point where it would be more nuanced as to the right. kind of operation right. it has. But, well, that is one of the things that the energy committee is looking at is not the, the cap piece, the cost piece, but just requiring disclosure. So when you buy a house, you may say, or rent a house. This house is renting for $1,200 a month. This one's for $1,400 a month. But $1,400 a month uses no electricity. The one is, you know, energy. Uh, and so that's sort of where they've been focused so far. Okay. Any more discussion? We're good. So we're looking for a motion to move this forward. So moved. through all of that, yeah. not how it ended up. Um, 
in particular, so the impetus of the conversation really had to do with a couple of blocks mm -hmm. in, um, around the Henry Street neighborhood or on Henry Street. Um, and probably a uh, comparison of some projects that people felt were not so, uh, did not fit into the neighborhood so well. So the one is, um, there's a 14 house townhouse project on Hoffman Road that was well in the public discussion. And, um, so I think that sort of became the visual um, identity of what's wrong and what could go wrong if the same number of units were put anywhere else in that neighborhood. And um, but after that came up, there, were, there was there were, was some change to the design standards required not just for larger construction but for all units that they had to be compatible with the neighborhood and parking arrangements, the layout of the parking, breaking up parking, um, the, the way the structures were oriented and the covered porches, and um, also the driveway location for um, these construction projects. So, and, and sort of going back and looking at, as Henry Street as an example, it's half the size in terms of acreage of that Hockenham Road example. So you couldn't necessarily just take the 14 units that were approved on Hockenham Road and do the same 14 units on the one acre parcel on Henry Street anyway. It just wouldn't be feasible, particularly given the new standards that are required to break up parking and maintain it in place and set back. Those, those design standards we put in place in response to when right. this issue first came up. Right. So, and sorry if I'm jumping the gun, but so why was that not satisfied? Like, what, what specifically was not satisfactory about that to the folks who were upset about this? Um, I'm not. I'm not a hundred percent certain, and I think the idea was that um, perhaps there need to be more focused discussion about large projects because um, there may be other ways to, or additional design criteria for the structures themselves. Uh, let me just back up one and and um, remind you all that. On top of those standards, at the at the tail end of this conversation in front of city council, the councilors incorporated another provision for projects of ten or more units that required, and it's focused more on infrastructure and the site that the standards used for development had to be consistent with subdivision regulations. So that means side of the construction materials, the method of construction, um, the types of things that. Um, but the planning board approval? Well, these would all trigger planning board approval anyway, because anything but, over 2,000 square feet automatically is site planning. It's not the same as the subdivision. It's not a subdivision right. approval, right. But, it, but these are, we're all talking about special permits for the size. So even when the moratorium is over, these would be special permits. So obviously, with site plan approval, it's conditioning. Mm -hmm. For these things, you will have the ability to say no to a project. It is special permit now at this point, which it hadn't been before. So, um, I, you know, and there are, we're not going to have a lot of large, uh, you know, 10 unit projects in Northampton. Um, but we do know of a couple of sites in the residential districts that are moving in that direction. The whole redevelopment of the Shaw's Motel site um, will likely be. Um, Ten or more units. When the teardown moratorium is over with. Right. The 21? They, they, they do that. that could be 21? Is that the right number? I, I, um, I don't know if it was that many, actually, based on the acreage. I thought it was less than that. But still, they have, there's some number of units that, well, there's some number of units that are on the site, so I don't know how much. Let me add one thing that, in terms of the question about the due diligence piece. I think there was a wide diversity of opinions out there as to how much we should have design standards. And you all were very cautious about going too far in design standards. And at least some of the pushback, and I can't tell you what this, how much the pushback, was they wanted more detailed design standards. And so at least for some people, the compromise was below a certain number, they did a good job. Above, they want more details. But again, I don't know if that's a minority opinion or a majority opinion. But it wasn't clear either whether it was architectural standards 
right. or not, mm -hmm. yeah. or uh, an issue about massing, or the total volume. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think in some cases it could just be um, discomfort with having anything that's more than seven meters. Well, besides design, how that's defined, I think it's about cars, not necessarily traffic, but just what the cars look like now. Which you guys did a good job in the design so side. Parking in the driveways and all that stuff. Yeah. And Which again, we partially got things done already, we partially got some subdivision regs. But. Right. Are we talking only essentially about one street? No, this, this affects um, I mean, urban other residential cities. Right. Yeah, so like, um, Ward 3 is not the only ward that has urban residential city. So right. urban residential city surrounds downtown North Hampton. So, but actual, actual yeah. lots Street. that could be developed out like that. Right. Chapel Street is, is the URB. That's URB, actually. I think the pushback was certainly primarily yeah. ward. Right. You know, and, and the other concern that came up in the process in terms of the one big site is the Smith College, Fort Hill, Lot the Lima State, right. which actually happens to be um, Ward 3 anyway. It just seems like we had design standards for the city as a whole, and then we had some pushback on in this area for this size project, which we made modifications for, which were generally accepted, and it went through, and there was just a, some a hesitancy about that area and those size projects that they just push back again. Everything is good except for this, still don't feel right, send it back, but really don't know why. Mm -hmm. And so now we're left with fixing something, but we don't know does it does it really need fixing or, or what is it what is our charge? What are we what are we trying to do? Because they didn't really many of them want anything. Oh I understand no, that. And they that's why that. this is so complicated. Right. So just there's three broad approaches without any details. One is, in essence, do nothing. You know? um, the second is very measurable standards, like you sort of have already. You know, more measurable standards that I could go through and easily know if I meet or don't meet. And the third, because this special permit is, this, is not the measurable standards, but enough to give you feedback. That you know, Whenever we look at a building, we're going to look at how the building fits the neighborhood in much more detail than the existing. At the moment, three sounds like the most appealing, but when we're actually sitting here doing one, it's going to not feel that way because I want something the criteria. That, I want criteria to, to know where I belong yeah. on, on the issue. Well, I mean, one of the things that we could do is sort of look at, um, you know, look at maybe some pieces that were missing or that you all had decided on the first cut not to um, undertake, and then and figure out. You know, a couple of ways to um, to potentially incorporate something, and it's not, and it clearly the, the charge isn't that you have to make a change, but it's I think to investigate is this? Do you feel that there is enough in place um, for those special permit approval um, criteria, or does it need a little bit of tweaking, or does it need a lot of tweaking? <laughs> so another effort we're doing, which may or may not be useful for this, but so we committed to do work with the neighborhood and sort of think about what are the important character defining features for the Fort Hill campus, for the line of state, um, which may or may not end up resulting in thinking about regulations. And so you could, we could do that kind of approach, just go, you know, go back and ask some of the people who oppose this to sort of say, okay, let's not talk about density because the zone talks about what's allowed, but let's talk about if that happens, what are the character defining features. I think I'd be more inclined to do something like that, where we, we, we if we're going to add more measurable standards, then A, do nothing, or B, uh, further restrict the leverage that we have with a special permit. You know, to me, a special permit is broad range, and that gives us a lot of latitude. But if, if, we, if we confine the language in the special permit to say, well, we need this, A, B, and C, that seems to unnecessarily limit, limit us. You know I mean, I think the language is purposely vague in a special permit to give us some leeway because we don't have any leeway in site plan right. approval. I think it's true. I think it may be too vague now. I think it'd be. I like the language. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Well, there were some um, new standards put in place in this package that weren't in the special permit criteria, approval yeah. criteria previously. So I don't think it's going to be the same level of vagueness as what's on the books for other special permits. Right. But the, the question is, could we add a you know, it sounds like you don't want to be too specific because the vagueness helps in the sense that if something might just, you know, despite the best efforts for design, if it really feels like it's not functioning on that property, then the answer is denial. Right. And you still want to have that leverage because you don't, you know. Right. I don't want an applicant to say, you can't deny because here's the criteria and I've met it all. Right. Even though it doesn't feel right to the board, I don't want to be forced to have to approve it. You know, because what used to be, I just think we lose leverage with a more specific language. But if you go back to the, the who's ever pushing back and find out what, what is it, what, what do you want to see, and we come up with one or two more design standards that we're all comfortable with and we don't think is too specific or limiting, then I don't see the harm in that. I'm hesitant to send you off to do work with architects who From what I heard of the discussion, that wasn't the problem. And I don't think that would be the solution. Well, right. We purposely try to stay away from right. specific design, you know, architectural design standards. So, so think of three potential standards. Design standards like we have downtown, the architectural standards. More sort of form-based code type standards. And not what the building looks like and what the appearance is, but how close the street is, so how far back so is, the layout. Up. And then the equivalent for everything else, the parking. Mean, you, you did some of this to the parking and the current rules, but the same thing at a bigger scale. You know, you know, what's the goal for hiding parking or not hiding parking? So it sounds like you wouldn't want the first one, the architecture, right. but maybe you'd want the layout, the form, and then a couple of buildings and the site. I just feel, I mean, I feel like we addressed that. We went into yeah. so much detail on that, which I was very happy to do. I think that those were really good changes, so I'm, just, I'm kind of at a loss as to what more because it could be different for a bigger piece of property. So think of the whole Warren estate. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. you get a lot of feedback that I have a relatively small property, but is the vision for alignment and making this up, you know, a block, you know, that matches the neighborhood to the south, mm -hmm. you know, a block where the blocks are 400 feet long? Or is the vision more of a campus type of appearance? Mm -hmm. We don't really have any guidance to right. somebody. To go back, and I think that I agree with both Mark and Jen, I mean, you know, we put these things in place, and, it, it, uh, you know, I, I feel like we might be leaning towards overreacting to a very specific circumstance criteria and react to that, but then that's going to have, that's going to ripple out over, you know, who knows what. And, and I think you're right. Every time you say what you don't want, by default, you're also saying what you do want. And I, I, I don't know. I, I got to go back to your of your three choices. I would probably choose the first one and do nothing and see how this works. Because I, I, I would just be, I would be hesitant to, to overreact to a, just a, what is, what, as I recall the conversation and following, you know, a very particular and a very specific circumstance that people were concerned about. And, Will the city council pass this uh, zoning thing without provision? Uh, it passed. It passed with Why a moratorium. Why is it for us? Then? Well, because there's a moratorium until July of next year. And the, more, the purpose of the moratorium is to have that further conversation, whatever that conversation ends up being, but to give time for there to be more discussion. And then it will sunset. The, the moratorium will go away. And ordinance stays. And I think in good faith, we need to I mean, not, do, not choose to do nothing right now. Just try right. to figure out. Yeah, right. I'm, I'm, I'm certainly okay with getting more feedback. I, I agree with Jen. I, I, it took us two and a half years, whatever, to go through that process. And I thought we addressed, at first pass, I thought we addressed those uh, particular concerns. But if we didn't, and, and more information is brought forward that we feel the need to respond to, that's fine. If not, we can just say, you know what, I, I think we're happy with what we did and, and do nothing. So maybe, does it make sense to put it on an agenda as a public meeting and get feedback from people who are concerned about this? I mean, because I don't really know, I don't, 
I hear what you're saying about Lyman, but that's not where the pushback came from. The pushback came from right. the Ward 3 properties. I think it sort of makes sense to put this in a later meeting and, and reach out to the neighborhood. Whether that neighborhood, whether that's a formal planning board meeting uh -huh. or a different kind of workshop sure. or something. Sure, whichever. Yeah. Just some opportunity to get the feedback yeah. to yeah. We really understand what people want. Yeah. I mean, because if Anne's right that this is really just we want to block any development, I understand that on an emotional <laughs> level, but that's not right. something we can address. Up uh, subdivision standard revisions. We got an executive summary. Yeah, we didn't want to give you the detailed languages. First, subdivision, do you think zoning is the sexiest thing? <laughs> subdivision <laughs> ranks are really boring. Um, so we just wanted to sort of go through in the big picture. So we haven't revised our, we haven't had a subdivision at all since the recession. We have subdivisions right. going forward. Well, it was already in process, but yeah, we haven't. I mean, State Hospital, that's a little different creature. but. Kind of Right, right. Um, so our subdivision regs are a little bit out of date. Um, they have a lot of really good things to them, and, and they're out of date in two things. One is just some things have changed. The other that I think has been a sea change in DPW. So things that DPW was very resistant on eight years ago when we last did our regulations, they're now much more supportive. So we want, we want to take advantage of that and come back for, for a couple of and, and so things which were out of date, just as we had markers. So we, we require basically um, the curbs in every site. And the water gets, gets channeled into a catch basin, and then goes out usually to the mission. Um, and we don't want the old country drainage where the water just runs off, because that creates erosion. But so when we last the rules eight years ago, whenever it was, we said, we're considered low impact development. We drop the curbs, you, you run the water off, and you do rain gardens and treat it. And we thought that's great, you know, we're really doing cutting edge. And all the developers looked at it and said, I don't want to figure this out. What I like about the subdivision regs is it's a cookbook. Even if it's a bad cookbook, I know exactly what it takes to get a <coughs> And so even though you were allowing LID, we were one of the first communities to allow it, not a single person took advantage of it because they have to figure this out. And so we're trying to get to the next step and start talking about LID. So that's the big one, and that's one of the big places where both the standards have changed. We now actually have other people to plagiarize from, and DBW is totally on board with it. So that's the first one. Um, although we may actually not find a lot of LID takers, just so you know, because it's really easy to do an LID in a suburban area with 150 feet of frontage. Now that a lot of our subdivisions are 50 feet of frontage, you, just, you can't just right. it. So, so that's one big one. Um, the energy piece, uh, again, you know, the state of the we've been pushing this and thinking about what are things that we can do. And we're limited. Subdivision control does not give us a lot of tools. But for Kensington and the states, you guys push them to think about the roads, so they were due east, west, or north, south, so you can get that solar layout. For the state hospital, you've begun being flexible about street trees, thinking how do we do street trees that don't shade the uh, uh, PVs. Mm -hmm. um, and at the Energy Commission, we've begun thinking about LID lights. Um, so sort of thinking about all those things. And then when we hired Nelson Nygaard to do the Main Street, King Street charrette, one of the things that they said is, why do we have street lights that light the cars where they're driving? We really want street lights for intersection, crosswalks, we do already, and for sidewalks. And LEDs fit that because it's a much more direct light. So, so those things generally for energy. The area that's a sea change, or this may also be sort of a, a work in progress, so I would expect number four to be the, um, hardest negotiation in this process is thinking about what are, what are the actual standards. We've done a lot in terms of granite curves and concrete sidewalks, but we haven't done a lot in terms of what's the curve return. So you can imagine the sharper the curve, the closer an intersection is to a right angle, the shorter the pedestrian crossing distance is from one street to another. But the harder it is to send a fire truck or a bus or a truck. Mm -hmm. And so finding that right balance there, um, I think again, I think it's made any area a lot of discussions. We have pretty narrow street widths, narrower than a lot of communities. Um, but we may still want to play with that, but maybe some opportunities to allow even narrower streets. So 
that's the big, again, that's the most complicated. And then, for those of you who are my age or older, you may remember the old days when we were comfortable walking in the streets. Mm -hmm. um, and then, as cars got faster and crazier and more suburban areas, we began putting granite curbs, and so cars could go up the curb and concrete sidewalks. So this is whole shared streets concept, which says, we're not straight, um, which says, we, we do all this stuff because the cars are going ever faster. If we can physically get, if we can both physically, physically and in terms of cues, get cars to drive slower, then maybe we can put people back in the streets. Think about Smith College campus, where there's a maintenance vehicle going down the sidewalk, you don't worry about getting killed because they clearly defer them to you. What are the equivalent ways we can do that? Um, and we had a meeting with DPW, they were actually surprisingly supportive of it. These are, we don't have to low box. I don't even have that bad sense, but it's, you know, it's a very different concept. You're dealing with some real challenges for snow removal. Um, a lot of stuff is easy without snow removal. It's really a challenge. Um, Speaking of that, on a totally separate subject, but somewhat related, that the new people, People's United Bank that opened, there was going to be a, for a stretch for the length of the property, uh, bollards or something to protect pedestrian or it hasn't gone up yet. Is it still going to happen? Yeah, I, I mean, I haven't seen that they asked for their CEO yet. But it must be temporary CEO. Yeah, yeah, they have to grow. Yeah, I got the grand opening. Yeah. I'm curious when I drive by, just what I'm waiting for, whatever it's going to be, to come yeah. up just to see what people make. The cycle track, right? right, right. Cycle track. So from Barrett, taking a right on the King, there was going to be like some demountable something. There's no plowing in the winter, yeah. but we'll, we'll keep the bicyclists or pedestrians off of the King. Yeah. So. Yeah. Okay, sorry. A, so the sixth on the list of probably stuff that's of least interest to all of us. But in terms of the details, the stuff that, you know, when DPW's out in trenches and things don't quite work, what are they finding? Don't undersell soil boring stations. <laughs> I'm sure that's really sexy. Boring's even there. Well, yeah, because I was, um, the, the new office building, which is right there, and exactly the reason I think. I mean, I we, we find consistently the engineers are really good at looking at soil borings and figuring out the structural, the, the weight bearing capacity of roads, and maybe not so good at trying to figure out where the ground is. Uh, so that, those are the kinds of things there. The other one that we're still exploring whether we have the legal authority to do, but I think this is a big one, is under 4F, that's one of those for a second. This is sort of thinking about how big a block size is. You know, it's a street that is 250 feet long is incredibly walkable and 400 feet in the Northampton context is reasonable. A street that's a thousand feet between streets just feels like a, you know, it's a long way to walk, you know, a quarter of a mile. Um, and so thinking about block size, the problem is because we don't have big 100 acre sites to get developed, we're more likely to have a state hospital type approach where maybe you have a longer block, but you have a sidewalk that goes to the middle of the block. So at least for pedestrians and dog walkers, it feels short. Well, New York City is sort of New York seems to be in it. Yeah. I mean, New York's, New, New York is 250 feet by 500. By 500. Um, I was thinking of the long, I was yeah. thinking of 500 feet. Yeah. Um, and most cities, New York's, most cities have 250 feet short and 500 feet long. So in an urban context, you know, 350 or 400 feet. You know, we have lower volumes, so it's hard to justify that sort of thing. But thinking about sort of what are those numbers for particular. So, from us, are you looking for us to pick which one we want to dive into first, or do you have a preference? That well, I think, I think we want to do this comprehensively. Um, this is an easier process in the sense that only the planning board has to approve this at the end. Um, you have to have public hearings and listen to comments. I want to see if there's anything here that you hate things that you love and things that were missing. Then you get, you'd like me to come back to you in a couple months in more detail, but this is sort of our first cut. What are we missing, you know, what are things? Yeah, just as an example of the, under the shared streets, um, it, it goes back to what Wayne was saying earlier that, um, for LID, that we're encouraging um, developers to look at 
different ways of doing um, construction, but they don't want to entertain that if it's not in a standard that it requires a waiver or if it's not written down. So we suggested many, many times for the North Campus at Village Hill that, that we should be doing some alternative design because it's supposed to be a village. Um, and they're reticent to do that because there's nothing on paper that says they can. And so to the extent that we do work through these things, you know, pretty, um, at a good, at a steady pace, then potentially the next time the subdivision comes in, which I think probably will be there before anywhere else, we'll have, you know, some other criteria by which the applicants can follow. Um, I mean, I don't know that anyone jumps out more than another for me. Some of these look, look interesting. I mean, to, I don't say they're boring, but some of them, I'd be interested to see what kind of uh, public input, how interesting it is to anybody else. But. <laughs> Are these sorts of things being measured against sustainable North Hampton standards? Um, in concept, San North Hampton isn't detailed enough. I mean, Certainly walkability, so that smaller blocks there. I mean, so no, no, nowhere does it say get rid of left turn lanes, but it certainly says, you know, design streets for all modes. I, I would say that best street friendly one, and maybe the energy one, is pretty consistent. I would say that one's just really unaddressed. address. Well, the other thing, though, if we're talking about narrowing streets and other options, it also reduces. Right, and stormwater, I mean, getting yeah. stormwater. Right. One of the that's appealing to me about the friendly street is you all in the last 10 years have made our subdivisions much better. And I'm really pleased with where we've gone, but at the cost of making them more expensive to develop it. I think there's some opportunities here that actually might lower the cost for housing um, and making things better. So, do you need anything from us? No, I just want to, you know, so keep going, and, and yeah. you'll come back with us, and we'll just jump right in. And it sounds like we're going to have opportunity this fall yeah. or winter to do that. Yeah. This one's probably a slower process. We'll be doing, you know, we're probably going to spend another month before we send anything to the W, and we're going to get feedback from them. So you're actually talking about what you call the Clarifying for the detail the options that a developer can use in order to get something approved. So if I wanted to put in uh, recessed tree boxes, then th there would be a, a parameter that I knew if I put it in that way, it would help me with my stormwater. Right. Okay. And you would get approved. Right. I think it's just like the design standards with, with clarity. You know, every everything's easier with clarity. With, with, when it's ambiguous, either people don't want to go through the trouble. Or they're not sure, so it drives up the cost because of hedging or just something. I think if we can be clear and still meet the goals that we set up for ourselves, and that's fine. And, and just to be clear, some of these would be giving developers an option, like shared streets, which I wouldn't require, but we tell people they could do it. Some might be required in terms of, of smaller diameter curb radius. We might just say, you know, you can't have a curb that's greater than 25 feet. And some are and some are easier for us. You know, things like the the shared streets. There's a lot of examples around the country now of shared streets, but almost all of them come from developers. I, we haven't been able to find a good stand, a good regulatory standard. Well, and as the person who thinks about those a lot, I'm beginning to think that they're not all they were cut out. I'm, it's almost like I'm beginning to think that in, in practicality. great concept and it, it had a lot of appeal, but when you actually try to do it, it's hard. That's a great example. That's the worst word. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay, we're good. Uh, last up, we've got some minutes from our last meeting to approve from September 12th. Second. Second. All in favor? 
<laughs> Anything else? No? Did I hear a motion? I move we adjourn. Brandy's out the gate first. Second. Second. Bye. All in favor? Okay, we're done. Thank you, everybody.